subscribing and leaving comments. Say they are not bad tracks. It's like watching the goddamn movie. Last year's not a secret. I would say it's not bad. Uh, can't hear you, Grover. Please pick up fine figures in stone engravings in the new and old worlds. Did you hear the tape must say they were bad tracks? You'll see if that's how you find it. They were bad tracks. I'm not that asshole who doesn't know anything about bad tracks. Black bears don't show claw marks in, in general. Grizzly bears do because they can't retract them. The Himalayan blue bears or some black bears, some bears, whatever. I don't know if they do or not. In last year's ISC conference, some guy gave a talk on the same thing on bear tracks in the snow in the Himalayas that they thought were what everybody was mistaken for. Alberta now. We went to New York City to a 
store of ethnological objects and there was a, some kind of a wooden head which looks, looked like a primate. So Alan Bryan asked the manager, is this from Northwest Coast? And the manager said yes. And I asked Alan Bryan, well how did you know? It was from the Northwest Coast. And he said, well there are monkeys in Japan and either a monkey or a deer or it must have somehow by trans-Pacific contact or so come from Japan to Northwest Coast and somebody copy this kind of a monkey. And this was a very logical explanation and so on. At that time neither he nor I ever heard about suspects. Only later when I heard about suspects I realized that you don't need Japan for such things because you have uh, some local being called suspects and then of course this changed uh, my opinion. Now, let's go to those stone heads. These, are, these were described by somebody by the name James Terry in already in 1891 and first were found by somebody by the name Professor Marsh who was at Yale University. So those beings are probably perhaps in the same place as they were 100 years ago. And already in 1891, Professor Marsh was the first to say, among many stone carvings which I saw, there were a number of heads which so strongly resembled those of apes that the likeness at once suggests itself. So it's really not suspect people who suggested these apes, but the man who did not know anything about Sasquatches said this 100 uh, years ago. Excuse me, is this out there, Mark? Yeah. yeah. I think I have some kind of a wooden thing here. <coughs> so here you can see what's always interesting around eyes and the pretty wide nose, and we are going to see it in on other art objects too. Here is another one. You can see from the side, hardly any nose, and we know that apes don't have really noses. Here's again another one. And here's the same head uh, twice. Oh yeah, I have to make this lecture short. We are late in time, so I spent most of the time in uh, giving those illustrations. But anyhow, they are from John Day River, which is a tributary of the Columbia River. It's made from basaltic rock and so. It's very important to say what is an object made from because you can see here those objects were made of many places but they not only use the same image, they use the same kind of a rock while in another place they use another kind of a rock. And this basaltic rock, which is a very hard material, was used, in, uh, uh, it grows in John Day Valley in Abidans. And that's important thing, because if you have a, an object and you don't know from where it is, and this you find all over, that archaeological objects are not so easy, uh, it's not known where they are from and so on, then by analysis of the material one can figure out sometimes uh, where they are from. Now the next one. Well, here they are. Here is John Day River. And you can see here, here is some kind of uh, emptiness, which means here are the mountains, and here are the settlements. And you can see from John Green's map that sighting 
of Sasquatches and footprints are found where people are, where people are they see, but in the mountains you hardly uh, find things because if somebody goes to mountains and if Sasquatches exist they move away, so it's always, and then and saying that's important is found always on the edge of mountains or Sasquatch area and so on. Well, those three figurines which I showed were discovered in different places, but they show very much similarity, same style. And somebody by the name of Winger in 1952, who was a great specialist on the archaeology of Northwest Coast, said, One type of sculpture is particularly characteristic. It is represented by a number of nearly life-size heads carved in the round and frequently referred to as ape or baboon or dog heads. The majority of them are in every respect sculptural masterpieces. While differing slightly in minor details, they closely adhere to a basic type. The proportions of the heads are long, deep and narrow. The cranium is shallow, the eyes are large, protruding ovals, the nose wide, convex, and terminating in spreading nostrils, the mouth large, sometimes partially open. And another thing is that the heads are not part of a sculpture, but they were made just for themselves, or as Winget is saying, per se. Nowadays, some archaeologists, like the famous Northwest Coast archaeologist Butler, B-U-T-L-E-R, is calling it stylized mountain sheep heads. Well, they don't look like, uh, to me, like mountain sheep, but then, of course, the word is here, it can change the meaning stylized, because it's not exactly, but why not call it stylized ape heads? And you can do the same thing. There was a very famous uh, European... Can you go back on that? They, those eyes look like they, they, they have stereoscopic vision to this job, like primates as opposed to human. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, they are all uh, here. Uh, Professor Gideon, who was a famous art historian and uh, from Switzerland, he thought they represented animal ghosts. Well, that's the similar problem if you don't know what it is, it's a ghost. If you're an archaeologist, if you find an object that you don't know what to do with it, if it's not a knife or, or an axe or so, then you call it ceremonial or religious object, which means you just avoid the question. Well, here is, a, not, oh, can you go back? here is another head which was published in a book about uh, Northwest Coast by somebody by the name Duff, D-U-F-F, and uh, it's uh, found in Centennial Museum Vancouver, and it's a similar thing, but it's uh, slightly different. We don't know the place, so it could be that it was made in, in Canada. I don't have any more information on it. Well, this is now published by John Green. It is what's very interesting, and what John Green pointed out as webs, and this was pointed out by Sanderson in his book in 1961 that from uh, footprints of Sasquatch he, the, he never finds mud in between toes so it must have had web and this is found later. So this is a possibility that we really deal with a stone foot as a Sasquatch uh, could have had. Well, of course, all this is a speculation. Then here is a mask which I found in a book by Quinault people, Q-U-I-N-A-U-L-T people, and it shows some kind of a 
extension here, which could be interpreted as brow ridges, and uh, nostrils, which humans don't have. I never saw a human with nostrils, and it looks to me very much of uh, ape-like being. And uh, just to be uh, sure, on the same page they show a human. You can see here the brow ridges are here and not at all all over. There is a no nostrils and the mouth is different. So what I want to say that they really uh, know the difference between an animal and human. And uh, so it, it is never that one should never underestimate native artists like they don't know what are they talking, they just make things. So it is definitely clearly shows something which is uh, different. Okay. Now here is something which they themselves, it's not I, call the suspects. What's interesting is that this is this mask is from early 20th century because everything after 56, 57, when Sanderson published uh, two articles in uh, True magazine, can be suspicious. Oh, it's made up story. But everything earlier can be taken as really possibility. I know there is, for example, in uh, Canada a book that some people, I can't remember, Saskatchewan or Manitoba, saw some kind of hairy being looking through the window at them. And uh, they were, of course, scared. And they concluded this was the devil himself. Because at that time, nobody heard about Saskatchewan. So such stories should be taken very seriously. And this is one of them. It's very early. If you take and this, you find through the whole lecture around eyes and wide noses and thin lips with eight feet, yeah? Four minutes. You're not joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Now here is where those Indians live, but they traditionally are perhaps from some other region. <coughs> here is a what you two people and here are stylish. Don't play me. me from northwest coast. Round eyes and so on. Now we are coming Bet to Siberia. Is this very similar? Round eyes, round mouth, and this is what looks like hair. Here is another one. Again, same styles in Siberia. Another one. Nobody knows when they were made. Lower, you could perhaps go for a walk. <laughs> here it is the river Usuri, and here is Amur, which divides Soviet Union from China, and it is here and here where those strange rock engravings appear, and it's not on the sea. So everything is away always from the sea, from people, so pretty much away. Now we are coming to Copan, a Maya city, I think in Guatemala, and this is how it looks now. Here is a mount, and here is something what they call reviews that archaeologists. And here are two figurines, and one of them is here. It's in Western Honduras. Uh, Honduras, sorry. And here is a snake going out of his mouth, and the face is a little bit strange. Here it is. Oh, it's a little bit upside down. Uh, here it is another one. You can see again huge brow ridges, protruding teeth, which is characteristic of 
age and facile man that they have, uh, what do you call this in Latin? Prognatism. And as I can see from photos, no chin. Here it is again, huge brow ridges, wide nose and so. I guess I don't have time to read you description. And uh, so, so what you find here is that you, what you find in rock engravings in the, on the northwest coast in Siberia, that all those beings don't look mongoloids, even if the mongoloids made them, because this face is definitely not mongoloid. And uh, and so, and the natives people know exactly what is what. Once I interviewed somebody from Liberia in Western Africa and he told me some hairy beings there have a said big nose and he said, you know, it's like you people, you European like people have noses, not like we have and so on. Uh, well again, Copan is on the edge of the mountains, it's very much south while all other these famous places like Mayapan, Chichen Itza and so on is. So it's always on the edge of human, uh, where human uh, uh, live or inhabit. So the question is, what is it? Well, I talk to Maya specialists and they tell me it's a Maya god. It's a monkey god. But uh, this is not found in any inscription. It's not found in any manuscript, so so why do they think it's a it's a monkey god? Well, he said it looks like a monkey. Well, it doesn't look to me like a monkey at all. It doesn't look even as an ape, and it looks like I'm like a strange kind of a man, because monkeys in the new world don't look even look so advanced like the monkeys in the old world, but mo looks more like lower primates to to the monkey. Another possibility is said to be a storm god. Well, since storm was so important to Mayas, they were agriculturists, so one would expect it to have a storm god all over. But this kind of a storm god is not found. This god is only found in Popa. This again supports. So it was something which, uh, which somehow perhaps survived. And I suggested in my book, which is this yellow book on this table, that in Greece some kind of a early Homo sapiens or Neanderthals survived. And being in the forest, some people started to, to make up stories and uh, started to make up that he was perhaps some kind of god. And this is the origin of the Greek god Pan. And this might have been the same kind of things. Because humans don't live in the forest, they visit forests, but they don't live, and anybody who lives in the forest uh, must be some kind of a supernatural spirit, ghost, or, or God. This is the last one. Ah, how is that? It's quite funny, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In a sly way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you take the wrong cruise? We have now a presentation. We can have individual questions and again, uh, maybe at the end of the panel discussion, we can worry about it. Now we have a quick uh, talk by Paul Freeman that got uh, stripped from you. all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.